Hello and welcome to Composer Talks with White Bear PR. And today's topic all about social media. I know, very exciting. A lot of people have been asking us to do that. And I'm um, honored to have a special guest with us today. And that is social media expert, Leona Lowry. Hello, Leona. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> a few words about Leona. She is a freelance PR consultant and social media manager. She works primarily with people in the arts, composers, musicians, and music industry professional. She always leverages social media strategically in a service of specific objectives, and she'll talk more about that in a minute, and always serves each of her clients' individual needs. Her clients are, for example, well, composer Alan Menken, Van Arts Music Supervision, classical trumpeter Mary Elizabeth Bowden, and the Van Eating Galleries, to name just a few. When she works with composers, she either, or with clients, she either takes over all their social media needs or just helps them with strategy and objectives or does also social media training. So, Leona, let's get this started. So, Leona, what is your overall social media strategy when working with clients? I think the major thing that I do is set objectives six to 12 months out from where you are right now, and then determine what the best mix of marketing and public relations choices is to achieve those specific objectives. And social media should be part of that mix. There, there are very... I think in the years that social media has been the bulk of what I do, um, I can only think of one time that a prospective client came to me and said, here's what I want to do. And I said, oh, social media is inappropriate for you. He was, uh, he owned a fitness studio and he was targeting women over the age of 70. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, save your time. Let's do something else for them. Uh, but for everybody else, I mean, really, the way I see it, Social media is like, uh, imagine there's a mixer, in, for our purposes, a professional mixer, where everybody relevant to your career is. And if you are not there, then either nobody is talking about you, or people are talking about you and for you, but you've surrendered the opportunity to speak for yourself and to have a presence. And so it's not a magic easy button. It's not a place where you can go and just say, I am here. And people are like, we've got a job for you. Um, but you know, if, if you're using it consciously, if you're making, if you have a strategy behind the way that you're showing up and you are doing something that's towards a specific end, social media can be very effective in helping you get there. So do you think also composers who will do their own social media, uh, it would be wise for them to ask themselves, why am I doing social media? What is my goal? Uh, what is my message? Why am I doing social media and who do I want to reach? Absolutely. I think if nothing else, it really helps you clear out the clutter of what it means to do social media. You know, there are so many platforms that you can invest time and energy in. And I think composers, just like any other artist, you're working from a limited amount of resources for the most part. You're always gonna be choosing between spending time and spending money on something like this. So unless you've got the money to engage somebody to do it for you, and honestly, even when you have the money to engage somebody to do it for you, it's still gonna take time from you in order for it to be authentic. And, you know, it, I, the way that I work, I always want my clients to drive the voice, drive the creative tone, really be active participants in producing the content that we put out. Otherwise, it's going to sound like some hack PR person is doing it for them, and that's not going to be as effective. Um, but I think if you have a clear sense of what you're trying to accomplish, like let's say, for example, that you are an up-and-coming composer, and that your intention is to build an audience so that you can leverage that reach when you are seeking job opportunities. And you wanna be able to say, I have a recognized name, I have a total audience of 100,000 people on social media, you know, I may be new to this industry, but if you associate with me for your independent film or whatever it's gonna be, 
my name is going to help sell this project. My presence is going to be part of what happens in the media for it. I'm, I'm an asset that you want. You know, the approach to building that audience for the sake of just having those numbers is a totally different approach that you, than you would take if your goal was to build the relationships with decision makers and studio executives who are on specific platforms and are most accessible there. And so, you know, if you're doing one, like there's a good argument for some composers to be really active on TikTok. If that aligns with what they're trying to accomplish, there's a better argument for other composers to be more active on Instagram, for example, if that aligns with their objectives and having an understanding of what you're trying to do helps you figure out where to invest the time and in what ratio, what the mix is for how much energy you're putting into each of the different platforms. I mean, and that's just one thing, you know, if you're thinking about like, what are my assets that I can leverage in this space? You know, like say for example, that you are just showing up and you are trying to accomplish something for the first time, but you're sincerely best friends with somebody who has a huge audience on one of these platforms, that's a good argument for starting there so that your best friend can amplify the things that you're doing and help accelerate the growth of your audience. Um, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, there is a, you know, to, to become an asset because you are on social media and there is a few composers who I think were really great with that, but, it's only a few, I feel, but most of the composers I know use social media for different reasons. And, uh, and the problem that I see often is that you try to build your audience and the audience you build, you build with your friends. So it's always the same circle. And then you run an Emmy campaign or you talk about your premiere, you talk about your projects, but you always kind of talk to the same audience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, and then uh, often young composers say, yeah, but I don't have any news. I don't want to come across as like selling myself constantly saying, hey, look at how great I am. Now I'm doing this, now I'm doing that. So how can you create content to go beyond that, to not constantly, not bothering, but like preaching to your friends and creating content that is actually worth posting? Honestly, I feel like the objectives answer those questions as well. And those are the complaints that I hear from people who enter social media without a clear sense of purpose for being there. You know, it's, it can be so overwhelming, especially like if you don't like social media, if it's not fun for you to be there, which, you know, for my client base is true across the board, I would, they wouldn't hire me if they thought it was fun. They would just be doing it themselves. And, you know, when it feels like a chore, and you're treating it like a chore and an obligation, but you don't have a clear sense of what it's even supposed to do for you, that is what it feels like. It's like, why do I wanna keep showing up to Insta? What am I even supposed to say here? Here's a picture of my donut on my keyboard. Um, you know, okay, great. But I think what people lose sight of in the arts, you know, if you've succeeded in making this your job, I feel like there's probably a day <clears throat> for everybody who succeeds in making music their full-time job where they're like, oh my God, mom, I made it, you know? And then like a year, five years later, they're like showing up to work and they have forgotten how special what they do is. There are aspects of what anybody in the arts does that are so inaccessible to regular people. So behind the scenes stuff actually is interesting to a lot of people. Some of it's boring to everybody, but not all of it. And, and what I find is that you know, for the most part, when I, when I audit uh, composers, which is something that I occasionally do just to sort of see the state of the industry that my clients are in and look at their social media profiles to determine who's really succeeding and who isn't from my perspective, I would say what's clear to me is that 99% of composers are operating on social media without a strategy. And that they're just showing up and feeling like, I don't really know what to say unless I've got a red carpet thing to go to. But then even if they do have a red carpet thing, they're not necessarily doing it strategically. You know, like they're going to this thing where they are surrounded by celebrities, some of whom have huge social media presences, some of whom they are in photographs with, and then not tagging those people, not putting those photos up in a timely fashion, not leveraging that opportunity. They're in the right place at the right time with the right people and they still don't really know what to do with it 
because they don't really understand why they're bothering. And, and so if they can get really clear about what it is they want to do, then you know, that answers so many of the questions about how to do it, when to do it, what the editorial calendar should be that drives it, if they need help or if it's something that they can find some pleasure in. And you know, I think if you were to audit the composers, your peers, and go and see who's doing a really killer job, who, who is generating jobs as a result of doing this and generating buzz, you know, Hans Zimmer is the person who stands above the crowd in terms of his social media presence and how effective it is for him. And from my perspective, what it looks like is he is paying somebody to do that for him and they're doing a great job. <laughs> it's funny, you just mentioned one of my pet peeves and that's tagging and mm -hmm. writing the text so you can actually tag someone uh, meaning, let's go by the premiere. You know, it could be celebrities you're in the in the photo with, but also, uh, you know, tag the, the the project. You know, don't just write about it. Look if they are also on Facebook or on Twitter and tag them. Mm -hmm. Tag your director. He will, you know, your collaborators, uh, editor, music editors. There's so many people you can tag in a post than just saying that's me at the premiere to so and so and uh, a lot of people I feel forget that or write the text smartly enough so you can actually tag and then also use hashtags and that's a whole other subject I, I, I'm sure you can talk about and don't say working composer but why do you do a hashtag so maybe you can talk a bit about that also. But you know, again, I'd say the objectives in your brand are the things that dictate how you approach those things. Because if you're approaching it like, on Instagram, I use tags. I must have seven hashtags for this post to be complete. Like, that's going to come off as dull as it sounded just then. You know, if, if what you're saying is, like, let's say, for example, that you are at a premiere that Jason Momoa is at. Well, that guy has a social media following. You know, he really has fun with it. He knows what to do with it. You're going to want a photo with him if you get the opportunity. You're going to want to tag him in it so that he'll see it. Maybe some of his followers are going to find you. But the way that you caption that photo, the way that you compose that photo should be authentic to you. If it's not authentic to you, whether that's like the real true you in your heart or the you that you've established as a public persona that is the brand you are putting forward for your career purposes, that inauthenticity is going to work against you every time. And so if you look at composers, like, you know, you mentioned that I work with Alan Menken, and I am conscious of the fact that he is a 70-year-old man who is a beloved Disney legend and a really kind family man. He has, he has a very authentic persona of nice guy who, who fits in this world. And his posts are not going to be the same as I would do if I was working with Billie Eilish. You know, she's, she's a public figure. She writes songs. You know, there are ways on paper you could say these are the same thing, but they're not. And, and I think that authenticity is what resonates with his fans. They want to see something that matches what they're expecting from him. And so if you go in there and you're like, I'm going to do this the social media way, and you're not having fun with it, and it's taken from some checklist of how to be effective on social media, that's not necessarily going to be the thing that's most effective for your purposes. But again, if you don't really know what your purposes are, then you're always just sort of rolling the dice with whatever you do. It's a, I mean, you mentioned authenticity, and isn't that also the key to it that, uh, you know, and it also goes back to knowing your brand and who you are as an artist and uh, what, you know, even as a composer, you, you know, who am I as a film composer? What is my work? Yeah. And that also informs your social media. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, when we come back to content creation, it's not only the red carpets, it's not only premieres. There's so much in between. And I think also people, you, you mentioned Alan and I looked at him and you, we also get a glimpse who he is as a person, who, who he is beside being the composer in the studio. And I think that is in, very interesting also because our industry is so much about connection, about people, you know, someone that sits with you in a studio for seven, eight weeks and works with you. So they do want to get to know also the person. Is mm -hmm. that someone I want to hang out with? And so mm -hmm. that's why I feel this might also be important. Yeah. Um, 
one thing I want to talk about social media for me is not only about postings. Um, you know, that's maybe 50%, but then obviously, or maybe more, but it's also about engaging, um, replying to other people, posting, giving compliments, giving, you know, if you have a director and he has a film out there and you love the movie, genuinely tell him what you thought about it. It's joining groups, maybe on Facebook, it could be composer groups, it could be filmmaker, film festival groups, but use social media as a tool and not just it's so then it doesn't become just about me posting yeah. what's what's your take on that again it starts with what your purpose is um you know because this is super time consuming i would say that social listening is the biggest part of my job in terms of where my hours are allocated um for for my clients i use a tool that allows me to create an aggregated inbox where i can monitor all of the incoming messages and comments that they're getting across their different social media platforms as well as do strategic listening for keywords phrases and hashtags and so from that mix depending on what we're trying to accomplish with social media i can surface to them the things that i think are worth their attention or worthy of a comment things like that. And so uh, that takes up to two hours a day, depending on what's going on with them in the news and what's going on with them in the ether um, to go through up to thousands of comments. And it, it's something that, you know, you can automate it to a certain degree if you're getting that level of stuff coming in, but the automation robs you of the opportunity to reply strategically to things. So it, do, it really helps to have human eyes looking at it and thinking through where is it worth directing energy and time for responses and engagement. And it's, it totally depends on, again, what you're trying to accomplish and where you are in your career. So, you know, if you are somebody who's super well established and, you know, if you are a Hans Zimmer, for example, it's a gift you're giving your fans if you are engaging with the comments that are coming into you. And it's something you're probably doing because you think it's fun if you're engaging with other people's content, but it's not mandatory. You know, you can, you can coast at a certain level and get away with it because your pipeline is full of work and you don't need it. This is, this is more of a broadcast medium for you at a certain level. But if you are an up and comer, you know, and, and you're somebody who's building an audience, building a network of connections, building a presence, then the engagement is way more important where you're engaging with and amplifying other people's content, where you're interacting with the fans whenever they say something to say, oh, thank you so much for making the time and energy to say something to me. You know, that is an investment in building your audience, your reputation and your brand. But again, like if you're just sort of floating around in there without a clear sense of what you're doing or why, it's hard to choose who you should be making that effort with and how much energy and time. And, and I think also one of the things that I've noticed is not everybody has the eyes to discriminate about which things are worthy of time. Um, I think of social media being sort of like, you know, like you, Thomas, you're not a native English speaker. You've been living in the US and so you know, coming in to a culture that is still a Western culture and coming in with English that you've learned, there's still an amount of, this is not my native culture and I need to listen for context cues and rely on the people I know who were here first to sort of guide me through picking this culture up. Social media is the same thing. You know, everybody's technically speaking your same language if you're there, but it's not automatic that you understand the nuances of this setting that you're in. And if you don't take the time and energy to really listen before you talk or to engage somebody to help you with that kind of learning the landscape, it's difficult to prioritize which of these things is worth me responding to, which of these things is a fake account that I don't need to bother with, which of these things is inflammatory and potentially going to get me in trouble if I engage with it. And so, you know, if you don't have the eyes, if you walk in and you're like, you know, I'm, I'm just so much in my head as a composer that I cannot differentiate between these different things and I don't know what to do with them. Like that's a perfect time to have somebody help you with it. What I liked, what you just said, uh, what, you know, I mean, there's so much to like what you say, obviously, but you know, that, 
be generous also on social media and amplify fellow composers, filmmakers. I think that always comes back to you because, you know, again, it's collaboration and, yeah. uh, and, and people forget that. And what I see a lot of composers, you know, you hang out in your composer peer groups. It's like you and your studio, then you go to composer events and then you do the same on social media. Oh, so you look into perspective or the SCL, but why not join, you know, uh, a director's group or, oh, you go to Cannes Film Festival, so why don't you join a Cannes Film Festival group and see what's up or Sundance, etc. or, you know, Women in Film, uh, Film Fatales. There's so many groups out there if you do a little research. So you have to get out of your comfort zone and of your own circles. Same with networking, but also on social media, I think. I, I feel like... You're absolutely right. And it, again, you know, not to be a, a one trick pony here, but if you're clear about what your objectives are, then you know which and when and how much and, and what to do. Like, because you're a different, you know, every composer is at a different place in their career. And that doesn't necessarily mean I'm new to this field or I'm established in this field. It could be I'm established in this field and I haven't worked for a while you know, or I'm, I'm established in this field and I am only getting calls for one kind of project and I want to be seen as a more diverse creative, you know, whatever it is that you are trying to accomplish with your career should dictate exactly that. You know, if you know that, like, let's say, for example, that you said six to 12 months from now, I want to be working with this specific director. You know, what I would do is a degree of light stalking to figure out where that director is. Like, wh where is this person gonna notice you? And if it's a director who has a social media presence and there's someone that you can engage with directly or indirectly, where you can like, again, if you're thinking of this as like a professional mixer and that director is across the room and they're talking to some people and you know a couple of people there and so you can join that conversation, that's basically what this is. It's this giant open mixer that we're all invited to, but not everybody knows how to work a room. And, and so having a sense of what you're trying to accomplish in the room helps you pick out where you're gonna go, who you're gonna talk to, and then you know that listening tool that's so key. Like maybe if you're just joining these groups and using them as a way to listen to the community and understand it better, that can give you so much insight for in-person interactions. Like you, know, you join a CAN group, and then when you're at the festival, you know how to start conversations. You have a better sense of how to work the actual room because social media gave you a leg up on what to do there, but you knew that's why you were showing up and it made the time more pleasurable. It made that feel like an investment instead of a chore. And you know, I think that I'll always come back to that because if you look at my body of work, if you look at the people that I've worked with, I do something different for every single one of them and it's because it's always led by what are we trying to accomplish here? And, and that dictates where we're spending the time and how much listening we're doing versus talking, et cetera. Are you annoyed so, me from uh, saying it over and over? <laughs> well, this is wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah. There is a few questions where, you know, when I give talks at USC or NYU and they're always the same. So I'm gonna ask you now, um, any preference on social media platform for composing, you know, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, maybe, uh, YouTube, uh, I would even say IMDb to some degree. So what do you feel is most valuable for a composer? Well, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Instagram is my favorite and it's, it's for a few reasons. And this is, this is a moment today. I'm saying Instagram is my favorite and this has been true for a couple of years and this is exactly the kind of thing that could be obsolete by the time you share this video. So, you know, keeping in mind that social media is a maddeningly transitory landscape, uh, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on TikTok as a place that I may have to start spending more time soon because there, there's a growing trend of it being a place to break music, but that isn't necessarily applicable for composers yet. So if we're talking about this audience, one to keep an eye on, but Instagram's my favorite. And the reasons for that are, it is a platform where people go to enjoy creativity. 
So, you know, Twitter has become so political in the last few years that it's just no fun to be there. And from my perspective, the creatives who are still active there are creatives who are comfortable operating politically publicly um, or who are just so entrenched there that they're not going to give up their millions of followers on Twitter for the sake of moving to a more pleasurable place to be. Um, Facebook has done so much to really make it difficult to do purposeful things there. They want you to pay them. So if you've got a Facebook page, it's basically a broadcast platform. You're not going to reach much of your audience unless you pay to reach that audience. But Instagram is still a place where you can make an organic impact without having to spend a lot of money, uh, where people want to see you talking about your donut and your work and something pretty that you saw and the celebrity that you hung out with. That, that content is welcome there and appreciated there. And it is a friendlier community than YouTube. YouTube has some of the biggest trolls on the internet when it comes to the comment space. I'm very conservative about emphasizing YouTube for my clients because the labor of monitoring how people interact with them there is so much more intense and you're so much more likely to have people be jerks there. Um, but on Instagram, almost always people are nice. And if they aren't nice, it is pretty easy to block them and report them as spammers. Um, but in addition to that, it's popular enough that your audience is likely to be there. So it's not like you're just picking the easy, nice thing because it feels safe and comfortable. It's also a place where you can get some results from having shown up and done something there. And how easy is it to share your music on Instagram? Super easy. Um, if you're willing to make videos that are a minute or less, then you can do it in your primary feed. Uh, you can also do videos of up to 60 minutes, I think, in Instagram TV. And now they're rolling out some other solutions to compete directly with TikTok that will allow you to do alternative versions. So it's always going to be video content there. But, you know, video can be anything. It can be, you know, a still of your cat that you put music over. It doesn't have to be you and a full orchestra or a clip that you've had cleared from one of the projects that you've been in. But, you know, it's a great place to share music and it's a great place to engage with other musicians. So I, I personally like Facebook uh, also because of all the group aspect and communities and, you know, uh, sharing into groups and meeting people. Uh, what is your take on personal versus artist page? And when do you start an artist page? If you're talking about Facebook specifically, I would say that this is, a, this is the difference between somebody who enjoys using social media or is at the point in their financial trajectory where they have to do it themselves and somebody who doesn't like it and or can pay somebody to do it. So if you enjoy using Facebook, if it's someplace that you're logging in to interact with people you know in real life, then doing the personal profile is totally satisfactory. It has a limit on the number of people who you can claim as friends. Um, people can follow you without being connected at the same level after that. And again, Facebook is biased against people doing business unless you pay them. They will shut you down as a spammer if you start doing things that are too promotional um, unless you pay them. The profile has fewer options for professional endeavors than the pages do, but they want you to pay them. And so it will always come back to that. Like how much money do you want to spend on promoting? Um, for me, it's always going to come down to who your target audience is. And each of the platforms skews a little bit differently in terms of age and gender mix and geographic location. So, you know, if you know for sure that your target audience is on Facebook and that you can connect with them, and either you have to because of money or you want to because you think it's fun, the profile is gonna be just fine. Uh, if any of that changes, you know, for the most part, my clients have pages that, that I manage for them because they don't think it's fun, they don't wanna spend the time there, they don't have to because they can afford to pay somebody else. <laughs> There you go. I know we could talk for hours and hours, but we have I could. to come to an end. So, so if you look back at the conversation we just had and you would have to give it three hashtags, what would the three hashtags be? Set goals. And, you know, if I'm explaining what the hashtag is, I mean a six to 12 month goal. Any farther out than that and you can't count on these platforms to still exist. <laughs> it's basically why I limit it to that. 
uh, if you were making MySpace goals on a five-year plan, you were out of luck at a certain point. Uh, so hashtag set goals, uh, hashtag listening. You know, if you are entering social media with any amount of trepidation, listening is the first step. You have to learn by listening before you can be effective there. And I would say hashtag authenticity. It has got to be, it has got to ring true to you or it is going to bite you in the butt at some point. And know your brand and your objective. Yeah. Set goals. Know why you're Set there goals. or don't bother. <laughs> you're not helping anybody if you show up and you're like, I hate it here. Like, that's not working the room. That is, that is somebody who should just go home and have a nap. Same with networking, right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Leona, thank you so much. Uh, um, I hope for our viewers this was helpful and inspiring. Uh, if people want to get in touch with Leona, uh, they can always write us and we'll connect you right away. Um, is that the easiest for you? Yeah, I would like that if they connect with me through you. I like you. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, join our social media channels and uh, our subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you, Leona, for now. Thank you, Thomas.